Good afternoon, everyone. Boy, I'm, we're almost going to hit the century mark. Um, unfortunately, that's not age. It's the uh, number of people who are <laughs> attending. Um, welcome. You know, this is our very first program in our new uh, class of 1966 Tiger Talk series. And I'm, I'm really glad we got so many people joining in today. Um, we, and by that I mean our class leadership, want to do things that keep our sense of community and keep us active and, and uh, give us opportunities for ongoing learning. And so this is all part of what we call our healthy aging agenda, um, uh, or to put another way, ways that we can stay young and, and active as long as possible. And Tiger Talks is one of the ways we came up with to stay in touch with and, and learn from each other. Um, and in doing so, give uh, some of our classmates an opportunity to highlight uh, accomplishments and adventures. Uh, we figured that uh, with technology like Zoom, we can reach out and, and do this on a regular basis, uh, no matter where we all live. And uh, as uh, I can tell from everybody who's here, we're really spread out from Australia to uh, um, wherever. So, so in our first series, what we're gonna do every month is we're gonna focus on classmates who are published authors. And we're gonna have them talk about their books and other subjects that reflect their life's work and, and passions. Uh, and some of our author speakers may be new to you. Uh, some perhaps you've already read or heard before in person, if you've been at reunions or other class gatherings. But I guarantee that uh, for this series, everyone will have some new material to share. And we got plenty to work with here. We're using um, the class of 66 library, of Charles Plones. And over the years, Charles, or Charlie as I like to call him, has been collecting all of the writings and publications of our classmates he could find. And his library isn't quite as extensive as the fabled library of Alexandria, but it's, it's pretty darn impressive and varied. You know, from the, the new universe and human future to the song of the chickadee from LA in the 60s to the journals of Lewis and Clark, from North American Pinot Noir to Africa, Charles um, has collected and documented over 500 books and, and research papers and publications uh, that uh, 175 of us have authored. And um, evidently we're still writing and publishing and, and adding to that total. Uh, he does not have my senior thesis, but that's because, that's because I burned every copy I could get my hands on. Um, Charles has really provided the class a, a valuable service, and, and we've, we've now given him the uh, official title of class librarian. And that means he goes on the letterhead of our stationery. Without him, the series wouldn't have existed, but he's not the only one. Steve Harwood has done a great job of organizing the Tiger Talks committee and overseeing the production. And John Homan is handling the publicity. And then we've got Gib Henschke and Henry Von Cohorn and Lanny Jones, all part of the selection committee. Um, thanks to, to all of them. Um, well, you guys zoomed in to hear John and, and I've said enough. So uh, what I wanna do now is we'll turn you over to John Homan and he's gonna explain some ground, ground rules and do the introduction of John. And I know you're gonna like this. Hey, thanks for coming guys. Great to see y'all. Uh, thanks Rick. Uh, I, I should start by saying that uh, Rick has won our informal bet. Uh, he, he, he said that we were gonna have over a hundred participants. I told him he was out of his mind. Um, it turns out that he's less out of his mind at least on this topic than he is on other topics. Uh, so j just a few ground rules for the session. Uh, everyone is now muted. Uh, don't unmute yourself, please, uh, because otherwise we're going to hear your dogs, your grandkids, and so on. Delightful as all that is, uh, we don't need it. Uh, we also are recording as we speak, um, and this recording will be posted on the 66 site. Obviously, that's mostly for the benefit of those who are not here today. Uh, but if you know anyone who wants to see it, uh, that's where they can get the link within a day or two at the most. We will have a Q&A. <clears throat> the way we're going to handle the Q&A is you need to write your question or comment uh, into chat. 
So everyone has a chat function. Uh, you write it, uh, it will come, you can send it to everyone or you can just send it to me if you like, but if you send it to everyone, obviously everyone will see it, uh, which is fine. Uh, and then I will moderate the Q&A afterward. We're not going to do Q&A during the, during the session itself. So if you write in a question or a comment, uh, I'll read it. It's possible. I'll call on you if, if more is needed. In which case, you'll need to unmute yourself uh, for that purpose. But otherwise, everyone will be will be muted. Uh, we're also uh, during the talk. You're just going to see the speaker. Uh, you're all probably all familiar with gallery view and, and speaker view, uh, but uh, we're taking command of your of your desktop during the speech, so you'll only see John uh, when he's talking and any media that, that he's presenting, of which there is quite a bit. Um, after the talk is over, you can choose speaker view or gallery view as you like on your device. If you choose gallery view, you'll see a checkerboard of, the, of everybody on the call. That's up to you. But during the during this talk, you won't have that option. We also have captions turned on. That's for the benefit of anyone who, who has any hearing issues. Uh, if you don't see them on your screen, uh, every device is different in terms of how you turn them on. So I can't give you instructions for that. Uh, you can also turn them off on your screen. But in any event, there is a, is a caption feature. Uh, just a couple of words about future talks. Uh, on October 13th, uh, our classmate T.R. Reed uh, is going to speak. Uh, renowned Washington Post columnist, uh, author uh, on healthcare and tax reform, also one of the four guys of whom I saw at least one on here, uh, uh, Fred Talcott uh, is another, uh, who pulled off the Joseph Osnott caper. Uh, and then on November 17th, these are both Wednesdays, uh, Joel Premack, who is our valedictorian and locomotive prize winner, and of course, a renowned physicist. Uh, if you have any suggestions for future 66 Tiger Talks, or for that matter, for Locomotive Award, uh, write to Steve Harwood. Uh, if somebody, Steve, maybe you could put your uh, email address in, in chat there. It's zzz9harwood at gmail.com, three Zs, zzz9harwood. Um, well, that's all for that. Uh, let me talk about John for a minute. I know that many of you uh, know something about John Hammondway. Um, and so I apologize if I'm repeating for those of you who do, but many of you don't. Uh, John is unequivocally most of our, one of our most accomplished and widely traveled classmates. He came to Princeton from New York City. He majored in history. He ate at Ivy Club. Uh, his whole life has been one of creating many books, documentaries, films. Uh, he won two Emmys and two Peabody's as a documentary filmmaker and producer, including The Brain and secondly, The Mind on PBS. He also was host and producer of PBS Travels. He's written six books, the most recent of which he's going to talk about today in full flight, A Story of Africa and Atonement. I will tell you that I've read that book over the last week it is a fantastic book, and I do not use that word lightly. Uh, it's all not only beautifully written, but it has a startling outcome to the story, which you'll learn something about today. He also spent many, many years filming and traveling in, in Africa, uh, clearly a land that he loves. He's been on the boards of many animal and conservation nonprofits. He was chair of the Africa Wildlife Federation. He was appointed by Richard Leakey as international chairman of Wildlife Direct. Uh, he lives in Bozeman, Montana, as some of you heard, uh, and received an honorary doctorate, doctorate from Montana State. Uh, as you're going to see, he's a wonderful raconteur. And by far the most important is that his daughter, Lucia, uh, class of 24, is now on campus. And as far as we know, she is the only child of a classmate who is currently on campus. Although I'll tell you that we have uh, class children going down to age about 10 or 11 at this point. So there are others coming along, uh, but Lucia is the only one at the moment. Uh, I think what John would want you to know is that although he's gonna talk about several chunks of, of his experience, 
the important thing to him is that this is all reflective of what's happening in Africa as a microcosm of the world's troubles. John, take it away. John, that is incredible. Thank you so much for those kind words. Um, I, uh, this is really a singular honor. You know, when I was asked to launch the class of 66 Tiger Talks, I thought John, Rick, and Steve really had confused me with someone else, one of our class's many luminaries, and you know them all. We've had about 56 years to show off all our stuff, and so many of you have led towering lives in law, finance, the arts, academia, engineering, medicine, government, social service, and philanthropy. So I look at myself as kind of a fringe player. Uh, my only redeeming feature today being that I may have a bunch of fancy pictures to plead my case. And my case is Africa. I've been in and out of the continent for over 60 years. And I thought based on that experience, I'd attempt to encapsulate my feeling about the continent in stories that uh, define both its thrill and its heartache. I always believe that next to Princeton, the center of all my learning has been Africa. My wife calls Africa my first wife. To me, it is the continent, the greatest stage on earth. The battles that we fight on other continents, the wars we win or lose there, the loves that define our lives, the griefs that shatter our souls, they may feel like ours alone, but they were born and I count, contend inspired in Africa. So convinced of my own hyperbole, I want to plead my case through three stories. One about a woman, the other Ethiopia, and the last elephants. So I start with Anne Spurry, and here's a little film I made to tease my book. This is a story of mistaken identity. The woman I knew was simply not the woman who was. My story begins in 1980, when in Kenya, East Africa, I sought out Dr. Anne Spurry, famed flying doctor, beloved by all, selfless caregiver to the country's tribal people. Albeit a bit of a mystery, she was a legend even then having arrived in Africa in 1949 and later at the age of 45, learning to fly. Beginning in 1964, Anne Spurry launched her career as a flying doctor, landing on pencil-thin airstrips, risking her life over and over, all to help East Africa's tribal people. It was not long before the world began to take note of this remarkable lady of dual Swiss and French nationality. After my week flying with her, I wrote a magazine article, later a chapter in a book. 12 years afterwards, I made a documentary film about her. During its production, I helped her dole out medications, guide patients into the queue, and flew with her in the co-pilot seat. Throughout, I plied her with questions. Going back even further, you were in the French underground. Yeah, I was like, well, let's leave that alone. Okay. Even when she refused to discuss her past, I held her in such awe, I was certain that her reticence was a sign of modesty. I was not the only one denied access to Anne Spurry's past. A similar wall of silence thwarted all other journalists. Was it modesty, horror of the war, or something altogether different. As she aged, Anne's fame grew well beyond Kenya. Many called her one of a kind, others a saint. In 1999, Dr. Anne Spurry, still flying, still helping Africa's needy, died at the age of 80. Obituaries poured in from across the globe. All Kenya wept. Four separate ceremonies honored her life, one akin to a state funeral. It was then I decided to write a loving tribute to Anne Spurry. 
my book would showcase the exponential power of the individual to make a difference. How one woman could transform the lives of so many across an entire corner of the planet. But when I began my research, opening up files dating to the 1940s, I crossed a threshold. What I uncovered was utterly unexpected, with each file revealing a woman so different from the one I knew and a story that challenged all credibility. In archives I located in Switzerland, Great Britain, Germany, and finally in a medieval town in the heartland of France, I was introduced to a woman the polar opposite of the one I knew. I also found three women who had been with Anne in Ravensbrück, a concentration camp purpose-built by the Nazis for women only. Je crois que on ne peut pas comprendre et on ne peut pas demander aux anciennes déportées qui ont vécu cette expérience de la décrire pas plus qu'on ne peut demander à un aveugle de décrire les couleurs. I learned that after being caught in Paris by the Germans for her work in the French resistance, Anne, then a medical student, was transported to dreaded Ravensbrück, and there for 14 months she was incarcerated, much of the time unnoticed. But from September 1944 until the new year, 1945, in Block 10, everything was upended. What happened in that ward also shines a spotlight on another prisoner, one of history's most provocative and duplicitous women. After the war, justice was meted out in very different ways. One in a cold Hamburg courtroom, another under the hot African sun. I've learned that uh, there, there are no shortcuts. So you, you can retire at 20 or you can uh, retire at, uh, at 90. It all depends how, how you do the job. Because Africans really uh, believe in your, in your uh, uh, strength and ability to, to cure them. Those long ago events today tell us about love and lunacy, about the solemnity and peculiarity of survival and about the enduring power of Africa to transform and heal. In full flight, a story of Africa and atonement. Having known and admired Anne for about 20 years, at her death, I set out to write a loving biography of her. This wonderful, wonderful woman who grew up in France and Switzerland. My good intentions were shattered at the end of the year 2000 on the island of Lamu on my honeymoon. By accident, one night there, I came into possession of a document that Anne had concealed for 50 years, dated 1947 and headed Kraukas, Central Registry of War Criminals and Security Suspects. It listed criminals by country of origin. Under Switzerland, there was only one, Anne Spöri, wanted for crimes against humanity, including torture. I froze. How could my wonderful friend who had devoted her life to saving human lives be an international pariah? How could a smart, innocent young girl of a moral haute bourgeoisie family have colluded with Nazis? I had to find out. I began in Ravensbrook, trying to grasp her life under unspeakable conditions while colluding with her captors. Doors opened up for me across Europe, archives in London, Germany, Switzerland, and finally France, eyewitnesses. And then from them, I learned the worst of the worst, the depth of Hitler's evil, and the complicity of one Ravensbrück prisoner, a 38-year-old Svengali, Carmen Mori, and her inseparable friend, an impressionable and needy 26-year-old, Anne. Those who had seen her during the last four months of 44 would never forgive her. My job was not to condemn, 
but to understand. I determined it was, it was fatal attraction of the worst kind, an obsessive, even passionate attachment that turned a compliant young woman into a torturer and killer. And she got away with it, thanks to a wealthy father and escaped Europe and justice to settle in a forgiving, forgetful land. In Kenya, she reinvented herself as a selfless caregiver and her fame grew along with the effectiveness, effectiveness of her cover-up, one of the most successful of the 20th century. While no one questioned her skills as a doctor, no one comprehended her genius at transformation and she died a virtual saint. I think Anne's story tells us legends about the unreliability of truths and the variability of legends. Consider too the alchemy of Africa, providing cover for criminals, abetting fugitives, forgiving villains. In Africa, violence is commonplace. Assassinations often go unreported and murderers live high on the hog. Crime and no punishment, darkest Africa. And all the time, this is a land of ethereal beauty and human tenderness. So we return year after year, malls to the flame, sheep to the slaughter. The greater the odds, the greater the temptations. And we're drawn here much as was Anne. Now, <clears throat> speaking of danger, I head north to Ethiopia. I've been going there a bit over the years, but only last year, I went there in depth. The timing was both fortuitous and awful. <clears throat> Landlocked Ethiopia is the roof of Africa, source of the Blue Nile in the north, the Omo in the south. Virtually every inch of its arable land is tilled. What isn't yields salt. The Danakil Depression is the lowest point on our planet, a hostile place once a birth birthplace of all humanity, the source of all our beginnings. These beautiful Ethiopian Highlanders are deeply religious. Well before the advent of Christianity, Homer called this land the most remote in all the world, its people beloved by God. Poised for Christianity in about 340 AD, the Highlands welcomed two shipwrecked boys, Odysseus and Frumentius, who spread the gospel. Multitudes of mountain people, already living halfway to the heavens, embraced it, and Christianity radiated across stubble, crags, valleys. Even today, as Western church attendance declines, in Ethiopia, it booms. The most pious attend daily with some so devout that even on a moonless night, they will scale an escarpment for dawn devotions. Now, I, I'm telling you about Ethiopian Christianity for one reason. Today, it's being brutalized. When the last emperor of Ethiopia, by the way, I took these pictures, was smothered to death in his bed, the country suffered. First came Marxism, then famine, and now Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed, who in 2019 was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for forging an alliance with Eritrea, that sliver of a country that denies Ethiopia access to the Red Sea. Shortly after my visit last year to Ethiopia, COVID-19 spread its deadly arms across the country and reduced it to a hermit nation almost simultaneously, maybe not coincidentally, the peace-loving prime minister then went to war, not with another nation, but with his own people, the Tigrayans. In a maneuver that would have dazzled Machiavelli, he enlisted Eritrea, Ethiopia's former enemy, as his ally to savage, rape, and execute his own people. The mountain churches we visited last year have been plundered, priests beheaded, nuns raped, relics stolen, and the lodge <clears throat> where we stayed burnt to the ground. 1,500 years of history has been trampled upon and the spiritual life of millions of Ethiopians desecrated. 
in Axum, alleged site of the Ark of the Covenant, 800 men and women protecting it were butchered, their bodies flung onto the streets for hyenas to polish off. The other day, someone said Ethiopia is a hyena biting off its own leg. Perhaps so. What is curious is that the horror of this story and others out of Africa rarely make headlines. And when the day arrives when peace is declared in Ethiopia, the silence will also be deafening. Let's turn the tide. Countries like Ethiopia, with its soulful history, its leadership dating back to King Solomon, and with ethnic divisions that reign unchecked, much like others across the world, are critical. One creature makes the story of Ethiopia writ bold. 3.4 million years ago, Lucy was born here. She and her kind enabled us to be who we are today. Please never forget, it's not outlandish to say we are all Ethiopian. I just wanna turn the subject over to elephants um, and another call for action. This one, a tad more uplifting. Who can resist elephants? When I first reached Africa, two years before my freshman year at Princeton, I found them pretty much out to get me. Over the years, I studied them and soon came to love them. Who cannot admire a creature that builds roads, sows seeds, loves, remembers, mourns, and communicates? The elephant is the pounding heart of wild Africa, the head honcho, in a pyramid of life. Fun-loving, sorrowful, sometimes vengeful, always caring, listening, learning, remembering. Elephants tell us how we can do better at being people. Now for the tough part. Elephants will become extinct in the wild if we don't intervene. When I first set foot in Africa, age 16, there were over 3 million. Today, they're down to about 350,000 and still dropping. What will this world be like without elephants? How can our children ever laugh and dream without elephants? So about 10 years ago, I talked the National Geographic into a film about the supply demand uh, chain of the booming illegal ivory trade. And so have a look at the opening of that film. <laughs> There was a time when the African elephant numbered in the millions. Seasons were measured by their comings and goings, and they had no enemy. But they possessed one fatal flaw, their ivory tusks, representing perfection, purity, and in time, money. And so the elephant became victim of its own magnificence. Today, its numbers have plummeted, and its very survival is in doubt. That is Venus. She was a lovely elephant. She was pushed. Why did our love of ivory turn so lethal? Tusks were in there and there. There's nothing left. We're facing a situation where elephant could become extinct in the wild. Now, two investigators go undercover and inside the illegal ivory trade and reveal it from both sides. Supply in Africa. So my friend, can yeah. you get a thousand kilos? Yes. And demand in Asia. You see the tusk with the, the curve like this. You can feel yeah. the tusk. Yes. Yeah. You're seeing $20,000, 100000 200000 and more. Today, a line has been drawn between those who wish for possessions and those who wish for something much, much larger in what may be the final battle for the elephants. So, a battle for the elephants reached a wide audience, but where it truly shone was in small screenings after broadcasts for leaders and opinion makers. Best of all, at least for me, it rallied children in classrooms around the world. Still, it didn't bring the international criminal trade to its knees, by gosh. So we made another film. 
based on a nutty idea of mine to create fake ivory tusks, to implant them with transmitters, to track the movement of the ivory traffickers. In infiltrating a terrorist group, Joseph Coney's Lord's Resistance Army, we made a horrific discovery. The LRA was not only slaughtering elephants, but also devastating the lives of children. Here we are on the border of Garamba Park in the Democratic Republic of the Congo on one of the most dangerous roads in all Africa. Village after village has a story of children being kidnapped by the LRA, living in terror, afraid of the bush. You can feel the tension here. These brave villagers are willing to share their stories in hopes that it will someday lead to Kony's capture. Ce qui était à à Bruce là avec la LRA, comment est-ce qu'il voyait les jets que la LRA faisait avec les éléphants? Qui dit ça c'est important aussi pour des projets aussi pour la communauté. Mm. Did she see them killing elephants? Yes, she said she, she said and she see them killing elephants. Mm. Okay. So I just spent an hour with these children who've ex suffered these horrible experiences. And what I'm hearing as a subtext in this story from these children is that the LRA are treating ivory as what it is, which is money. So, Father, you have met children who've been subjected to horrible uh, attacks. I've, so, I've met so many, even more than 1,000 of children who have been abducted. And some of these children have told you stories about ivory yes uh, i remember one kid who 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 told me that they, they used to carry <laughs> they call it white owns because they don't they don't know whether this ivory this is white long owns they used to carry mm. and the, the most recent one i talked to told me that they have sent us konya uh, sent us to go and uh, and they do the poaching in the garama national park mm. in this village. I meet this boy, Emmanuel. What was your experience with the LRA? I killed people. That's what I did. So one group was for killing uh, people, okay. and one group was for killing elephants, or? And I, I'm here to ask about elephants, which I know for him. Now, why are you talking about elephants? And he says, I wasn't part of the animal killing effort. Did you see elephants being killed? There was killing, 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 he said to me. I understand. Uh, I'm very sorry. From his perspective, I didn't get it. This is all about killing. I mean, here you see the real scars, literal scars of, of this, of life here. All this killing and suffering is being caused by one man who could be the ivory trafficker I'm after. Like a drug lord, Coney preys on the weak to build up his empire. That means maybe, if we can track him down, we can stop both the poaching and the human suffering too. Well, <clears throat> to date, uh, no one has brought the LRA to justice, although it's now a shadow of its former self. Meanwhile, the illicit trade in ivory continues in Asia, especially in dark corners of the internet and across Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. China has now declared the sale of ivory illegal, 
may be a hollow promise. Still, the price of ivory has dropped substantially to my great delight. Nonetheless, it would be dishonest to say the battle has been won. So here is, again, the ending of our first film. Later, in a gesture of transparency, Minister Kagashiki grants Aiden access to the ivory room. Now, Aiden will get a rare glimpse of likely the largest known cache of raw ivory in the world. Tanzania wants to sell the contents of this warehouse and has asked CITES for an exception to the ban. Uh, we're now standing outside the ivory room. Uh, I believe that uh, there have never been any pictures of this room, certainly no film of this room. So this is a historic moment. Helps to push it open. It's like going into some sort of ancient tomb. Can we go in? Yep. Right, OK, wow. There are piles of tusks on on the floor, stacked in shelves. Accumulated over the last 23 years, this stockpile is reportedly valued at over $50 million. This reminds me of some kind of genocide memorial or some solemn place that records what could be the end of the elephant in the wild. And the absolute shame of what is going on can be seen in this comparison. These are the magnificent creatures that used to roam Africa and the poachers are now slaughtering animals that have barely had any time to grow. I think that tells an unbelievably sad story. As one of the poorest countries in the world, Tanzania um, should try to get some sort of compensation from somewhere if they have a resource in order to be able to police the parks and national reserves against the poachers. But if uh, the international donors came and paid Tanzania money to burn it, would you support that? Definitely, yes. What I need is just the money out of that. I will support that idea very strongly. One consequence of the ivory trade is a growing number of elephant orphans. Here at the David Sheldrick Wildlife Trust in Nairobi, they are nurtured and rehabilitated for return to the wild. The baby quite close to me is called Basilinga. Basilinga's mother was shot by poachers when he was only two weeks. And this is because of the ivory trade, which is a big challenge for the lives of these animals. And at two weeks, he could not have survived if left out in the wild. <laughs> when they are very young, it's very sad because elephants are emotional animals like humans. And some of them, actually, they don't make it. So we have to keep a 24-hour care with them so that we can wipe away the trauma they have experienced after they have lost their family and protect and care for them. Elephants have very good memories. And if human do some damage, like killing one of the members of a, a family group, they'll never even forget the location where it happened. Those elephants, you know, will remember for the rest of their life. We shouldn't give up hope. But it is a race against time, because at the moment we're losing elephant populations at such a fast rate 
that by the time that the Chinese middle classes wake up, and by the time they stop buying all of this stuff, it'll be too late. One day I hope to return to China and meet the same people I've met during this investigation, shake hands and say, we're proud of each other. We made the right decision and the elephant is safe. So I end on that note, <clears throat> three stories that I really hope bring Africa into focus. So call me a cockeyed optimist, but I see the continent, even with all its staggering needs and crises, as a land of creative possibilities, a place bound to play or leading role in our future. I see hope there. I think Africa speaks to our deepest passions and concerns, and also to our deepest hopes. So to you fellow 66ers and to all who think globally, listen out for Africa, follow it, give it a chance. You may in time agree with me, it is the sum of all our humanity, past and present, and who knows more. Thank you. John, thank you very, very much. Uh, we, ha we have a number of questions here, uh, and I'm going to encourage others to now write questions into chat. But let me, let me start with a couple and sort of take them in order here of the topics you addressed. Uh, uh, Rick Bowers asks, this is regarding Anne Spurry, uh, whether you found evidence of other Germans relocating in Africa after the war. Um. She wasn't um, a German, um, but um, there were, um, I mean, there was actually one very, very notable um, English woman, um, Mary O'Shaughnessy, who had been in Ravensbrook <laughs> with Anne. And um, she ended up as a nanny in Kenya in, a, in the um, early 60s. And, um, and it's, <clears throat> there are only about 18,000 um, colonials, if you will, there at the time. And, um, and, and these were the only two Ravensbrook survivors and they met and, and that's a chapter in itself in the book. Um, the, um, I believe there were a lot of, um, um, uh, P, you know, Germans, collaborators, and a few others who used Kenya as cover. They used to say that it was a sunny place for shady characters. And um, it was, um, we, you know, over as I wandered around, I would hear about this person or that person um, named Platter comes to mind who had been in the German Wehrmacht. And he was a neighbor of Anne at a place called Ol Kalau. And um, Anne wouldn't talk to him. I mean, the only person in this entire community she wouldn't talk to. Uh, there are others, yes. So that, that leads me to a question, and this is a topic I know you've, you've thought about. <clears throat> um, you know, there were a variety of kind of people uh, in the camps who did bad things to keep themselves alive. Um, and some of them even believing they were doing bad things in the greater good of saving more people. Uh, is there any evidence that any of that was going on with, uh, uh, with Anne? Um, or is your conclusion simply that, you know, maybe she reinvented herself and, and had some remorse, but that she was simply a bad person when she was at Ravensbrook? That's a good question. Um, I mean, part of the question, I think, uh, John, is that you're saying is, could, could some of her behavior be, um, be um, um, uh, you know, 
accept it. Perhaps she was saving people from harsh deaths. Um, I, I don't believe so. I asked no. uh, Louise Laporte that question and she said, absolutely not. I mean, the other question is that um, there were there were lots of people who did bad things in, in Ravensbrook. I mean, you know, sure. You know, people going over to the other side. Um, but Anne was the most colossally dramatic uh, example. Uh, so sort did of continue. Answer, answer your question. I don't think I did. Yeah, well, I, as well as it can be answered. Uh, Lanny asks a, a related question, Lanny Jones, which is, were you able to find any letter, letters written by Anne that documented her relationship with Carmen Mori? And was there a single galvanizing moment when you realized her story was something completely different than you expected? Yeah, thanks, Lanny. Um, actually, there were lots of those uh, eureka moments along the way. And, and certainly those three eyewitnesses uh, contributed to those. But, but one of the things that really had a major impact on me was I, um, I, I was given access to uh, German files in Ravensbrück. Um, to all the Swiss files in Zurich and Basel um, and the British files that were um, um, war crime files that are in, in Kew. Um, and, um, but the French held out and they held out and they're all part of a, um, a military um, uh, 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 research facility um, that had been virtually locked down and was given, um, there was a moratorium of uh, either 75 or 100 years starting in 1947. And the idea I always thought was to protect a lot of people who uh, in France, um, who, who might've been part of the Vichy government, who then um, uh, wanted to gain a, a certain um, uh, governmental standing in the de Gaulle regime or something else and to protect them and their families. Um, so I asked for nine years uh, for, to the um, uh, Ministry of Defense um, to have gain access. And finally, finally, after nine years, I got permission. It was in August of a, of a year, and I was given three hours to look at the material the, in the Anne Shvery file. And um, I, I, I went down to a town in the middle of France and um, there I was in a kind of a boardroom, a guy with a gun at the end and with instructions that I couldn't take any pictures and I, I, um, I could only take notes. And in this file, which had a beautiful fleur de -lis pattern on the top and a red ribbon around it, um, I found um, Anne's uh, confession that she made. And um, so if you want to have one eureka moment, it was that when she actually said, I knew that I, I did wrong. I, and uh, that, um, um, uh, that Carmen Mori um, was a monster. And, um, but she had, um, all sorcery, I mean, she had, she was a w wizard and she had, uh, she was a sorceress and, um, and she, and, and uh, so she ensorcered me, if you will. And it was in that that I really realized that uh, it was a clear and evident um, um, uh, admission of, of guilt. When did she write that and to whom? Uh, she wrote it to a representative of the French military court who were investigating her in 1947. And... Um, and so she wrote it to this emissary of uh, the military courts that have four judges in France. And, um, and she was tried in both Switzerland, in France, and also in, um, they had a, a cool d'honneur, uh, an honor court that was assembled by members of the resistance and they tried her. Um, there are no, um, uh, the only evidence of that are our firsthand accounts of people who reported about it in um, in Hamburg in the war crimes trial. Um, and she confessed in that. 
but she confessed again to the French military and why she wasn't found guilty immediately on the basis of that admission. Um, I can only explain that by the, uh, but shortly afterwards, she fled France and um, her father uh, mounted a huge legal defense and he got her out of that. Um, and, um, and, you know, I think a lot of France and Britain, everybody was fed up with the war and they wanted to get on with things. And she was one of the um, people who, who benefited from that. And she stayed away from France. She was apparently not allowed back in France for 25, some say 40 years. Um, and she was never to practice medicine ever again in either France or the dependency of France. And um, she did that, but she did slip back in, in and out of France from time to time, uh, I think illegally. And But she stayed clear of Paris, where she would have been found out by people who had known her in Ravensbrück. Yeah. So, so switching to the broader Africa, uh, uh, Rick Bowers says, I've read that Nigeria may well be the most populous country in the world by the end of the century. Where do you see positive leadership emerging both in politics and conservation? That's a really good question. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I think that um, there, there are a number of, of bright lights right now in Africa. Um, I would say Rwanda may be one and Botswana may be another. Um, you know, the, the big man in Africa um, has dominated African politics for so long. Um, and I mean, I, I, I have to say that in the short term, I don't see a lot of hope for democracy. I, I, f I find that in all of these countries that have open elections, um, there is so much corruption um, that uh, people don't believe the 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 votes and people don't believe the uh, the outcomes, but I I do believe. I mean, the hope that I I I uh, latch onto is is um, is transforming Africa into the digital age, when I think that um, you have this vast population of um, potentially very very bright people who, given the proper education, can really become wizards and um and and uh, in in this whole um digital economy and um i i see that's where it's going there's something in kenya called impesa which is um and it was it led the way um through um, the, the exchange of money um and it it, it was well in advance of, of our country and Europe and so forth, um, and now the uh, it, it is it was the precursor of Venmo, put it that way. And you you used to see you'd go out in the middle of the bush and you'd see a Maasai guy with just a uh, shuka and um, no other clothes and, and you know everything blowing in the wind, and um, he'd pull out his cell phone and he would sell a cow and he'd transfer the proceeds electronically to his mother, let's say. Uh, who was 400 miles away. And, and this was happening um, 20 years ago. So I like to imagine things like that, um, transforming um, Africa. And also, uh, I, I mean, I can't speak very well about Nigeria, um, but, uh, uh, you know, overpopulation is really going to be um, the drag on, on the continent for a long time. And I, I think that there are some very, very bright people in Africa um, who are who have spoken very wisely and on a great platform about um, preserving natural resources um, and and uh, drawing lines around national re resources um, and containing human populations and giving human populations an understanding of how important those natural resources are gonna be. I'm thinking specifically of a woman called Paula Kahumbu in, in Kenya, who I, I worked with at Wildlife Direct, who's one of the, look her up. She is just, uh, uh, she's eloquent, she's, uh, she's brave. 
uh, I mean, really brave. I mean, one of the little things that she's done is she, she created a thing called um, Eyes in the Courthouse. And, um, and she, you know, all these, um, all these courtroom actions that um, were, were, you know, where traffic, uh, where ivory traffickers were uh, being held to account, um, she recorded them and she put people in those courthouses. So uh, there could be no shenanigans. And, um, and she set the stage and there are so many kids now who are following her who, um, who, and she now has a television program on, on Kenya that is one of the most highly watched uh, television programs all about wildlife. I mean, there are people like that. Um, and I've always told Paula that, you know, we've got to clone her in Tanzania. We've got to clone her elsewhere. So I see hope in Rwanda. I see hope in Botswana. Um, I'm going to be in Kenya at the end of this month, and I'm hoping to meet um, Uhuru Kenyatta, the president. Um, I think he's going to be out within nine months. And um, it's, uh, you know, watch who will be his successor. Um, we don't know, but I, I, I think the digital age is going to be the, the factor that's going to make things, it's going to hold people to account. It's also uh, going to allow a lot of people to have jobs. It's my hope. So I'm going to jump back to Anne Shvery just for a moment and then move on to elephants uh, because there was one more question about Anne. Uh, this is from Jim Parmentier. Uh, would you compare Shvery's behavior to that of Patty Hearst? Do you think she, meaning Shvery, uh, was committed to the, the Nazi cause at least for a while? Um, in other words, the Stockholm syndrome. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't know enough about the Patty Hearst case, apart from what we all know. Um, I, I would say that um, I. I think that that Anne was completely. Um, she 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 lost her mind to a woman, and um, and um, basically this woman was a um, was was you know Rasputin. And, um, and she completely transfixed this young woman in so many ways um, that, that whatever she said and did. So it, it wasn't a movement um, that she was in. It was just a, a personal relationship that uh, made her lose her mind. And I don't know if you'd call that the Stockholm syndrome. Um, I don't think it is because as soon as uh, she was separated she was separated from um, Carmen Mori on the 1st of January, 1945. Um, she, I mean, she changed her name amongst other things. And she went back to being a, a kind of a, a caring doctor. She was just a medical student at the time, but, but she looked after people. She did all the right things. And part of her defense was that her father helped Mountain, her lawyers, um, arranged was that that was used to to show her tremendous um, um, goodness um, and that all these witnesses to whatever she did in block 10 um, at the latter end of 44 didn't count um, so I, I mean she she was um, she was under the spell of a woman and I, I don't know what else to call it but that uh, Steve Gosen asks, and Steve, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your last name. I realize, even though I know you, that I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, so do, do you know of any efforts to develop synthetic ivory good enough to kill the market for natural ivory? Mm -hmm. um, not yet, although we came damn close. Um, I think it, it would be possible, but, <clears throat> uh, you know, uh, ivory buyers in 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 Asia um, uh, just wouldn't go for it. I mean, most of the of the f fake ivory that you find right now, you can put a, put a light to, and they'll start smoking. Ivory won't do that. <clears throat> um, uh, you know, there there are acrylics and there's plastics and various other things that could could be used, but so far there's nothing that I think. Uh, would would fool 
a, um, a committed collector. They will fool guys in the field who don't have enough time and who are far more gullible. But when it gets to a collector, I don't think so. And uh, I think there, there may be better luck with rhino horn. Um, and that they, there've been a number of studies I've seen that really suggest that rhino horn, uh, which is just basically keratin like our fingertips, um, can be um, uh, transformed uh, uh, into, I mean, can be replicated in some other fashion and can fool people. Um, in, in the Far East, ivory horn is not necessarily collected as something you put on your mantle. Uh, it's collected as a, um, uh, <clears throat> as a medical device. It helps you, um, it, you know, it makes you macho and it cures hangovers and all, cures cancer and all that sort of thing. I think they can fake that a lot easier. You know, so re related to that, I guess, uh, Willie Osborne asks, in addition to increasing donations to conservation organizations, are there innovative strategies like your decoy tusks with trackers that are being tried, such as following the money or freezing assets that are showing promise? Yeah, I mean, I, um, I you know, the, the greatest, um, um, uh, the, the greatest flattery is um, when somebody copies you. And, um, and I believe that, that um, they, are, they are using, and you, you know, the transmitters we had were about five inches long, a little larger than a pack of cigarettes. And, um, and now they've been able to um, reduce those in size to, I mean, almost minuscule. So the, what that opens up is all sorts of things. Uh, that can really help you. Um, you know, the biggest <clears throat> uh, impediment to finding out about illicit wildlife trade and the trade in guns and everything else is the container. The container is the most effective way of transporting goods across uh, international frontiers. And, um, they, um, and it's very hard um, you know, you can track them individually, but uh, getting inside is is um, is sometimes hard. There is, I mean, uh, some of the work that's being done is there are sniffer dogs who can um, um, who can find out if there's ivory inside, and they're very effective. Um, but at these big ports, um, um, you know, trying to get that kind of uh, <coughs> of of uh, uh, of, of legal power um, in, in operation on a daily basis is very hard. And don't, and don't forget um, that the Chinese, and I'm sure Lou Rutherford can speak to this much better than I can, um, in their Belts and Roads project, they're building up all these ports all around the world. And some of them, which they end up owning, they have several in Africa. And, um, and those are the... Um, or the flashpoints of the, of the trade. And so with it in the hands of the Chinese who are probably not that interested in, in bringing people to justice, the ports are gonna be really hard to, um, uh, to police. Um, I'm not, not sure I'm answering your question appropriately, but I do think that if you can, when you miniaturize these little uh, transmitters and so forth, they don't work inside the containers, but when, they're, when they emerge, they're very effective and they can tell a real good story about the bad guys and where they're coming from and where they're going. So while we're on China, uh, Lanny asks, what about the illegal trade for other wildlife parts in the American West? The examples he gives are bison and turtles. Is all of the demand from China? Yeah, also Elkhorn. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I don't know if I can really speak to that. Um, I know it's, it's flourishing. And, um, um, you know, I, I mean, I hate to say it, but um, we, we have to bring these, these wet markets um, into some kind of um, compulsory uh, um, order uh, because, uh, you know, I spent not so long ago, I was in Laos <clears throat> and um, on the border of Thailand, 
uh, China and um, uh, Vietnam. And, um, and you look at, um, and, and when you go into these um, uh, special economic zones, which are really run by mafia, Chinese mafia, you see every imaginable um, animal for sale. Um, I mean, it's heartbreaking. Um, I was, you know, our, our, our mascot, tigers. I mean, you'd go to a restaurant there and they would have a little cage with a full grown tiger outside, which you could buy for a banquet for $50,000. And uh, here was this poor tiger just circling, circling, circling until somebody um, uh, gave it the coup de grace and then, and then put it on the spit and had it for dinner. I mean, it's, it's just like, how do you stop people from wanting to, to eat um, exotic animals and wanting to have exotic animals in their possession? I don't, I don't have the answer to that, but um, I think that obviously COVID um, might, might bring the world's attention to that problem. And, and, and uh, I don't know whether uh, the government of Xi is going to um, um, uh, respond favorably to people um, acting as kind of nannies about that, but it is a real serious problem. So we've got th three more questions and therefore this is last call for questions if anybody wants to type, type one in. So the first one is from Ted Walworth. How, how do we do that? How, how do we do the question? Who's speaking? Lewis Rutherford. Thank you, Lewis. John, go ahead. Uh, so I'm looking for the button to press to give you a what, or just, just ask me your question, Lou. Oh, oh you've just mu muted yourself. Yeah, Lewis, if you unmute yourself, just go ahead and ask your question. No, oh, no, I can't hear it. Lewis, you're-, you're Lewis, uh, I've just asked to unmute you. There should be a button on your screen and you just click okay, we'll be able to hear you. Love. You hear me now. Yes. yes, we can indeed. Can you talk at all about entrepreneurship in Africa? Because when I was teaching at Thunderbird, which is an international business school, there were quite a few students who were interested to become entrepreneurs back in their home country in Africa. So there seemed to be something going on about young people starting businesses. Can you comment on that? Oh yeah, I mean it's uh, uh, it's one of the most uh, uplifting things um, uh, to see. There's uh, uh, you know who, uh, you know people taking plastic and turning it into roads. Um, people, you know, just there. There's so much inventiveness that I see. I go to Kenya more than other countries these days, but Uganda and Tanzania. I would include that, but I would say right across the continent, they're, they're just, there's a new generation of, of people who've got really smart ideas. Um, and I guess what, they, what the critical thing is, um, is are there enough, uh, let's say, uh, people who, uh, you know, um, VC groups who are willing to to take a risk on some of those um, homegrown African uh, ventures. And um, I think that would be a really, really marvelous way for people to get involved in Africa. I don't see enough of that. Uh, so you have great ideas, but probably not, um, <clears throat> not, 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 a lot, uh, not enough funding at this point. So if that can be bridged, um, I, th I think it's really good. I mean, there are a lot of these wonderful organizations who are helping women's groups uh, with um, micro, <clears throat> uh, um, micro donations that are really helpful. But if you could expand that to a bunch of these, um, these kids who are using the internet in inventive ways and finding uh, marvelous things like M-Pesa uh, to make life better in Africa and sponsor those people, that is really, I think, one of the, um, that's the future of Africa. Uh, John uh, T.R. Reed, and I have to ask his question because he's our next 
uh, speaker in October. Um, he wonders if you are the photographer in in the photographs that we saw. We, we you said you were of the Haile Selassie ones, but uh, of any of the others, you were the subject, of course, in some of them. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like the Ethiopia was mostly my stuff. I mean, I uh, we got some stuff off the internet, like Abi Ahmed, um, but most of the stuff, uh, a lot of the stuff. Um, <laughs> Uh, was was mine elephants mine? Um, no, and, not the one of Coney. One presumes, and not the one of Coney. No, <laughs> definitely not that, um, and others. Uh, but by the way, I just want to make. Uh, I want to. <clears throat> I, I want to draw everybody's attention to one of my film partners over the years has been Katie Carpenter, who's the class of '79 at Princeton, and she's uh, uh, and she's been uh, a great friend and a great. Uh, co-conspirator in so many of these films. We've made about five films together, and she was very helpful on 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 um, uh, Battle for the Elephants um, and um, Warlords of Ivory. In any case, it is so funny that <clears throat> this Princeton connection that keeps coming back and, and back and forth. So um, um, I just wanted to mention her. Well, so uh, Tr Tr just added who shot the films. So that presumably it was Katie in at least one case, but anyone else who's worth mentioning? Yeah. Well, uh, I, I produced, wrote and directed all those three films. Okay. Yeah. And, yeah, and you, you, at times co-produced with Katie. Yeah. <clears throat> um, uh, Ted Walworth asks if I can find it here quickly, do the travel companies like Lindblad and the Smithsonian who sponsor safari and Serengeti trips to Africa, dedicate some of their revenue to such survival and protection measures? Um, yeah, yes, they do. Um, uh, you know, Sven Lindblad is extremely uh, uh, generous in his, um, uh, uh, with uh, uh, very philanthropic. Um, and um, there are many others. I, I think that, any group that is going to Africa uh, and is not giving back in some way so should actually be run out. Um, I, uh, I've done a lot of trips with um, Royal African Safaris and they actually have their own foundation um, and they are vitally committed to helping communities where they operate. And, and frankly, whether it's Abercrombie and Kent or um, Lindblad or, um, you know, I can go through the whole list. Um, if they don't give back, then I, I, I have no sympathy for them. <laughs> Put it that way. So I'm going to combine two questions together <clears throat> uh, into one. Uh, essentially, it is uh, Glenn Goltz asks what to do socially. socially or politically about Ethiopia believed to be the future of Christianity in Ethiopia. Uh, I'm, I'm so sorry, John. I, I kind of heard the last part, but the first part I didn't hear. There was some sort of something going yeah, so, on. So Glenn Goltz asked, mm -hmm. what do we do socially or politically about Ethiopia? And then the second question was, what do you perceive to be the future of Christianity in Ethiopia? Well, I think that we should all um, really pay attention to Ethiopia because it is um, it is a country that's unraveling, um, and it's all because of this Tigrayan issue. And um, there have been, as a result of that, there's been instability virtually throughout the entire country, um, and they're using the Tigrayan thing to um, uh, as a cover for their own. Um, uh, malaise and and their own um, feelings of um, of of, of um, complaints against government. So, um, I mean, I wish I knew what I could do. I don't know, and I wish I could tell you what to do. Um, <clears throat> there will be times when there is um, a good, solid evidence that we can help philanthropically help the people of Tigray and the children, especially. Um, I don't know of those organizations right now. 
what I do ask you to do is really, um, um, you know, flag all those stories you see about uh, Ethiopia, follow them because it is important and it is a, a kind of an indicator to Africa. Now towards your second part or the second question, um, what is the future of Christianity in, in Ethiopia? I think it will survive. Um, it, it is heartbreaking that some of these treasures that are, are, are central to the Ethiopian Christianity have been looted and, and probably will end up on the, on, in some market somewhere. I mean, hopefully not at Christie's or Sotheby's or Bonham's, but, um, but, hopefully people can return them to uh, Ethiopia where they belong. Um, but I, I think that, you know, like so many religions, um, um, belief system is so strong that it is going to, uh, it's going to survive. Um, I do believe that people going into those mountains to pray and so forth, they'll do it in the cover of darkness now. And, um, and they will not feel secure um, until this horrible war comes to an end. Sure. So I'm gonna leave the last question to my oldest friend and good friend, Dave Lee. In addition to your own books, can you recommend any readings about Africa? Oh gosh, yes. <clears throat> um, I mean, that's a really big question. Um, of course. Why don't I answer it by, um, I'll try to put together a list. How about that? Um, because there are so many great books about Africa. I mean, I'm reading one now that I just think is fabulous called The Fossil Men. And it's really about uh, Tim White and the discovery of Artie in the, um, in the Afar, uh, which is part of Tigray, in fact. In the, and, uh, but it, it tells the whole story of, of uh, human development um, all as we know in Africa, um, I am. I, I'm working with uh, um, with Richard Leakey on a project called Garin, which is going to be a museum that is going to be built just on the Rift Valley near Nairobi, um, along the, the the Great Rift, which was the virtual pathway of man, mankind leaving Africa, and from there they would virtually people the world. And, um, and that, that museum is really going to be dedicated to the idea that we all have a common ancestry and that we all are African. And so that's, um, and, and so Richard's books are, are really, really important um, to read. Um, and, um, but let me put down a number of titles. I think that's the best. Yeah, we, we can post that uh, on the website next to the link. Um, yeah. Uh, the link to this presentation. That would be great. Well, so I think uh, probably this is the right time to end. Uh, uh, I want to especially thank uh, Steve Harwood uh, and his team, uh, Lyle Barrer and Lisha Tashkevich, uh, who behind the scenes have been doing all of the wizardry that enabled all of those films and, and photos and all of that to come on uh, and to mute us and unmute us and all of that. Uh, it, it's hard to do all that stuff. And uh, Steve has a, an organization, which by the way, he supports totally um, uh, that does it. So thank you to them. And most of all, John, I mean, we can't thank you enough. This is an extraordinary presentation. Uh, you are, as I said, a great rock on, rock on tour, uh, but more than that, the, the content and the importance of the content was really very special. Thank you for doing this. Thank you. You know, th thank you, John. Thank you, R uh, Rick. And thank you, Steve, for having been such great partners putting it together. It would have been a, a as we say, a dog's breakfast without you. Thank, thank you, everybody. We'll see you next month. <laughs>